Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, we do thank you for the great privilege of uh, studying your word. Uh, we do pray that you would give us a love for the gospel, a love for those who are lost, uh, and a love for, especially, for you yourself, that we would desire to do all things for your glory and to live not for ourselves, but for the Lord Jesus. Uh, do bless us in our time together today. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're continuing to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is illustrating from his own life how he was willing to give up his rights, uh, his freedoms, in order to bring about the welfare of those who uh, are in the church. And uh, he is saying here in, uh, in verses um, 19 to, to 23 uh, that particularly he has uh, become a slave to all, though he's not a slave. He has become a Jew to the Jews. Uh, to those under the law, he has become as one under the law. And yet, he says very strongly, he himself is not under the law. Now, he is a Jew, and he says that still, that he is not under the law, because the Mosaic law had come to an end with Christ. Um, to the, those without the law, Gentiles, he had become as a Gentile. And uh, he is saying that though he is, he, he says, to the weak, in verse 22, uh, I became as weak. Who are the weak? Who are the weak? Uh, not just the Jews. Not just the Jews. It's, it, it, you have weak Christians here at Corinth. Who are the weak? Now think about the context of what he's talking about here in chapters 8 and 9. Food sacrificed to idols. Who would be the weak? Newly converted Christians? It could be. It could be. But remember, he says that there were those who had a right to eat meat sacrificed to idols, but because of their conscience. Uh, they would do so, they would sin against their conscience. They would defile their conscience. The weak are those who had, uh, who had a conscience, uh, sensitive consciences, when it came to practices that were amoral, not right or wrong in and of themselves. And so Paul says in verse 22, I have become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. Now, what is Paul saying here? Uh, I have become all things to all men. Undoubtedly, some people would think that Paul was inconsistent because he would, uh, he would behave as a Jew with one kind of person, he would behave as a Gentile with another kind of person. Uh, they might also say that Paul was just a, a man pleaser, uh, that he was willing to accommodate himself for anyone. Is that what he is saying? You notice verse 23? It's not a willingness to accommodate himself just to please men. In verse 23, you see that he evaluated, evaluated everything in terms of the gospel. 
I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I may become a fellow partaker of it. So, he is willing to make great sacrifices for the sake of the gospel in order to, to win people to Christ. Does that mean he's willing to do anything? <laughs> no. Uh, what he is talking about is uh, mobility in, in method, not mobility in morals. He is talking about billing, being willing to make personal sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. He's not talking about doing something that is sinful for the sake of the gospel. For instance, in, in preaching the gospel, is it, is it okay to, to lie in preaching the gospel in order to win some? There are preachers who will tell stories as if those things had happened to themselves and they really haven't. Is that something that is okay to do? When that story may be persuasive to a person and influence in them to, to, to become a, a Christian. Quite a, few, quite a few years ago, Moody Press published a book that claimed to be written by a Native American. It was called Crying Wind. And uh, that woman who wrote the book claimed to have grown up on an Indian reservation and this was her story. It was an amazingly, or uh, it was a very popular book. It sold, sold over 100,000 copies. Many people were blessed by it. They were stirred up in, in reading it. Uh, in 1997, 20 years after the book had been written, Moody Press, on the basis of certain reports that they got, began investigating the matter and the claims of the book, and they found that it was not written by a Native American at all. It was written by a woman who was raised in Colorado. Uh, she was a white graduate of a... Uh, middle-class, predominantly white high school. Uh, relatives of her, hers uh, said that there is no Native American blood in the, in the family. And so Moody Press withdrew the book. And uh, Paul is not saying that we can do anything uh, lie or do things which are, are sinful in order to win people. He is saying that I am willing to make any kind of sacrifice, personal sacrifice, giving up my rights. Uh, I am willing to do many things as far as methods, as far as being able to reach people. He says, I do all things for the sake of go the gospel. Uh, Verse 22, I become all things to all men that I might by, may by all means save some. Can we save anyone? Paul says that I might save some. Now, of course, he does not mean that he is able to really save anyone. Salvation is of, of the Lord. But, God does use individuals, humans, human beings as his instrument. And uh, that human instrument is God's means to bring a person to salvation. That's what Paul is really referring to here. So, chapters 8 and 9, do not demand your rights. In love, consider your brother's and sisters. That's Paul's attitude. That's Paul's attitude. I am willing to make great sacrifices. Great sacrifices. Think about what he is talking about at the beginning of the chapter. He talks about the right to financial support, but he did not use that right. That, mean, that meant that he, he worked as a tent maker 
as a full-time occupation and then he worked as a preacher of the gospel as a full-time occupation and basically had had very little what we would call free time time for himself now is that kind of our attitude that I am willing to make any sacrifice for the sake of the gospel and the glory of Christ too many Christians uh, say uh, no because what Paul is talking about here demands too much sacrifice and that's why he says in uh, in verse 20 verses 24 to 27 27 this demands both sacrifice this attitude demands both discipline and sacrifice personal discipline and so he uses to illustrate that the figure of athletics in verse 24 do you not know that those who run in a race all run but only one receives the prize run in such a way that you may win so he uses the illustration of a runner in verse 25 he uses the illustration of a wrestler and everyone who competes in the games exercises control in all things they then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable the word that he uses here of of competing is a word that uh, originally referred to a wrestler but then it came to be used of uh, in a broader kind of, of category so anybody who would uh, compete in the kind of games that we would think of for the Olympics verse 26 is the illustration of a boxer therefore I run in such a way as not without aim I box in such a way as not beating the air so a runner a wrestler or another kind of athlete a boxer did Paul like sports well he uses athletics as uh, illustrations in a number of his writings we see here uh, and it was particularly relevant at Corinth uh, we are familiar with the Olympic Games that come from Greece the Olympics were held every four years and that's what we have done in the modern revival of the Olympics at Corinth there was another set of games that were held every two years the Isthmian games that's a pretty good word to pronounce Isthmian games but they were held every two years and in Greece they were second in importance only to the Olympics so uh, Paul says um, do you not know that those who run in a race all run what's the goal when you're in a race what is the goal it's to receive the prize it's to win he says only one only one receives the prize that is the goal of the athlete Paul says in verse 24 so run that you may receive uh, that you may win now what is that saying about the Christian life you're a runner you're an athlete you are in a a race the Christian life is a is a race it's like a race what's the re, what's the prize what's the prize we've had this a couple times in 1st Corinthians but at the end of the Christian race at the second coming of Christ we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and there will be rewards for the believer and so there is that reward when the Lord will will say to his own well done good and faithful faithful servant so the Christian life is a what kind of race is it 
it's really a, a long distance race. It's a, uh, it's a marathon or an ultra marathon. Uh, there are a lot of us that are willing to, uh, to be in a dash. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll go out all out for the Lord and serve him for a summer or for a week at camp or for some shorter kind of activity. That doesn't match up with the kind of, uh, of Christian race that Paul is, is talking about here. Now, verse 25 What's the characteristic of a world-class athlete? Notice, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. If, uh, if you are a world-class athlete, it demands a lot of self-discipline. Do you know any world-class athletes? Iowa is a, uh, is a uh, wrestling state, uh, high school and college wrestling. There is probably an enthusiasm here in this state more than any other place in the, in the country except maybe eastern, eastern Pennsylvania. I've known two world-class wrestlers that have grown up right around this area. One of them from Dubuque, one of them from, from Maquoketa. And what you see here about them is that uh, in order to win, in order to get to the top, they, they set a goal and they did everything to keep that, to, to attain that goal. It required a great deal of, of discipline. For wrestling, you have to be disciplined as far as your diet. You have to make weight, make weight. It is discipline as far as your, your training. These guys, when everybody else would show up for practice in the afternoon, they would get up at 6.30 in the morning before school. And they would run and they would lift weights. Uh, they would also give up a lot of things that were legitimate, things that were not wrong, things that were just a part of life that everybody else was enjoying because Either it would be a hindrance to their training or it wouldn't be a help to their training. Being a world-class athlete demands discipline. Paul is saying is that that is what should characterize us as Christians. What are they, what are the athletes, what are they striving for? You notice what he says? They're looking for what? What does he say? A perishable wreath, a perishable crown. You know what the, uh, the, the prize for winning the Olympics were? It was a little, it was a little olive kind of, uh, of wreath that was put around, around your head. That, that little wreath was perishable. It was not going to last very long. Uh, it was nothing really of ultimate value. Paul says that for us as Christians, we're striving for an imperishable crown. It cannot perish. It is uh, of eternal value. Now, why is it, you may know some, I know some athletes who are willing to make such sacrifice and exercise such discipline for something that is of such comparative little value when we as Christians who have such eternal value in everything that is done for the Lord that we are not willing to have that same kind of, of sacrifice and, and discipline. So, Verse 26, Paul says from his own experience, in his running the Christian race, 
he is purposeful therefore I so run I run in such a way as not without aim um, he says my my running is not aimless now um, if a runner is just running for exercise it doesn't matter where he goes uh, when I would run I would take off and go in any direction and just get in get in the doesn't matter where you go Paul is saying that uh, he has a specific a specific goal in running he says as a boxer uh, I box in such a way as not beating the air some have thought that this is referring to shadow boxing uh, shadow boxing is really purposeful training he is say, saying that uh, he is not taking wild swings <laughs> and missing the target uh, rather I buffet my body verse tw 20, uh, 27 uh, the word here buffet is to beat to beat your body black and blue or to give yourself a a black eye he is saying that he he strongly disciplines himself I make my body my my slave again do you have that kind of discipline he says lest lest having preached to others I myself should be dis uh, disqualified verse 27 gives us what Paul did not want what he feared for his own life lest having preached to others I myself might be disqualified now what does he mean by that that word disqualified uh, has uh, has produced uh, a lot of discussion what does he mean disqualified from what some people use this verse to say that you can lose your salvation that it would be disqualified from uh, obtaining eternal life now I would reject that because of the clear teaching of many passages in the New Testament including passages in the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 he gives uh, an elaborate argument to show the security of the believer in the end of Romans 8 uh, he, he says nothing nothing can separate us from the love of of God in Christ Jesus and then he names every possible conceivable thing and nothing can can separate us what's the context of this passage it's not the context of what must I do to obtain salvation or keep my salvation it is the context of rewards Paul isn't isn't saying that he will not be allowed to compete in the contest he is talking about being disqualified by a a judge a number of years ago there was a, an Olympic skier who won uh, I think he won the downhill slalom uh, only they discovered uh, quite a bit later that he had missed one of the gates one of the uh, one of the one of the poles and so he was disqualified um, so Paul is saying that he did not want to be the uh, the word is literally disapproved and uh, what you talk about being disapproved is determined by the context in first Thessalonians he talks about I have been approved and he uses this root here uh, by God to be a preacher of the gospel he's not talking about salvation there he's talking about approval and disapproval in the Christian life as far as rewards 
Uh, what does it mean to be disapproved? It means no well done, good and faithful servant. That would have been a tremendous disappointment to the Apostle Paul. Is that your ambition? To be pleasing to Christ? Ah, what, what kind of disappointment would it be to you if you did not hear those words? You ever seen an athlete, top, top character, who got second place five minutes after he lost? That's a tremendous, that's a tremendous disappointment. So what he is saying is that uh, if you refuse to sacrifice and exercise discipline, you insist upon your rights, uh, what happens? You hurt the weaker brother. That is correct. But you notice what he's saying here? You not only hurt the weaker brother, you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself. So, um, Paul has used chapter 9 as the illustration. Now notice, verses 24 to 27 are really transitional verses. He, uh, he, he ends there, uh, lest I myself should be disapproved. Those are transitional verses to the warning and the application that we have in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is the climax of uh, these three chapters on the subject of eating meat that is offered to idols. Verses 1 to 13 are the warning. And he uses Israel and the history of Israel as a warning to the Corinthians. Verses 14, chapter 10, verse 14, on then to chapter, probably chapter 11 and verse 1, the first verse of chapter 11, um, should probably be taken with chapter 10. And Paul is uh, giving the application of the principles that we've had in chapter 8, the uh, illustration of the principle in chapter 9. He's going to apply it to the Corinthian situation. Do you remember the three, the three questions that the Corinthians would have had about eating meat offered to idols? What were the three things, specific questions that they would have had? Can I what? See, he's going to specify these here in chapter 10. That's why uh, it's, it's good to, to spell it out. Can I go to a pagan temple and participate in the feast that they have there? Can I do that? That's the issue in chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. Can I go down to the meat market and buy meat there when there's a good chance that some of the meat has actually been sacrificed to idols. Can I do that? And that's in verses 23 to 26. And the third thing would be, can I go to a friend's house uh, when he is uh, inviting me to a, a, a meal or a banquet in his home, and maybe the meat that he is serving me is meat that has been sacrificed to idols. That's verses 27 on through chapter 11 and verse 1. So those are the three specific questions in the last half of the chapter, 
the first half of the chapter is the warning. Paul talks about being, being disapproved, disqualified. And uh, he is using Israel and their experience in the wilderness to, uh, to illustrate this. Uh, look at verses 1 to 5. He looks at the advantages of the Jews. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Notice the word all, twice there in verse 1. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. You notice the word all? What's he doing? In verses 1 to 4, he is, he is enumerating a number of Jewish advantages, a number of Jewish blessings. And this was something that the whole nation, all in it, experienced. But, verse 5, nevertheless, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. All of those who came out of Egypt, uh, Mo, uh, Exodus would describe uh, a number of 625,000 besides women and children. And all of them received these blessings. But he says, with most of them, God was not well preached. Do you know what that word most means? How many of those that went out of Egypt that were 20 years and older entered into the promised land? Huh? Two. Joshua and Caleb. So, uh, with most, two, <laughs> all except two, most of them, what? Were Disapproved, that's our word back, back in, in 9, 927. Uh, and it's clear, he's not talking about salvation. That most of them that were not, that with whom he was not pleased, who did that include? Moses, right? Moses didn't enter the land. Moses was disapproved. Aaron was uh, disapproved. He didn't enter the land. Miriam was disapproved. She did not enter the land. With most of them, he is not talking about salvation here. He is talking about uh, not, not pleasing the Lord and being able to enter into the land. Uh, of the blessings, he talks about uh, verse, verse 1, uh, our fathers were all under the cloud, remember the cloud, the, uh, the pillar of cloud guided them by day, the pillar of uh, fire by night. What was their blessing, privilege? They had supernatural guidance in the, in the wilderness. There are five blessings that he enumerates here. The first one is supernatural guidance. Um, verse one, they all passed through the sea. There was supernatural deliverance as they passed through the Red Sea. Verse 2, And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, that's an unusual reference to baptism. And we can see here a, 
uh, a more general idea of, of baptism. Ad baptism has to do with identification. They were identified with Moses. Uh, they had a supernatural leader, and they were identified with Moses, uh, uh, the leader that God gave them. So a supernatural guidance, a supernatural deliverance, a supernatural leader. In verse 3, they had supernatural food, and they all ate the same spiritual food. What was that? That was the manna. That was the manna given to them by God supernaturally. Verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual drink. What was that? The water that came from the rock. We're gonna, he's, he's going to refer to that uh, in verse 4, but Moses was, uh, was told to strike the rock. And the water came forth to supply them with water in the, in, the, uh, in the wilderness. Now, this verse says, they drank from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was, was Christ. Now, if you look at if you look at Exodus 17, that was the beginning of the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings. And Israel cried out for water. Uh, Moses was told to strike the rock, and the water came forth. When you come to the end of the 40 years, in Numbers chapter 20, the end of the period, they are complaining again because there is no water, and Moses is told to speak to the rock, he struck it with his rod, and the water came forth again this time. So you have the, the water coming from the rock at the beginning of the 40 years wilderness wanderings, and at the end, there was a Jewish legend that the rock traveled with them through the wilderness. Now, Paul is not referring to any kind of legend like this. What is he saying? He says that the rock, the rock followed them and the rock was Christ. What was the rock? The rock was the visible means of supplying them with water. What was the ultimate source of that water? wasn't an old rock in the wilderness. The ultimate source was Christ. That's what he is saying here. He is looking at what happened there uh, in the wilderness Christologically and saying that, that it was God the Son that provided that water for them. And since, since the water came from the rock, rock at the beginning of their 40 years and then at the end, and since the supplier was Christ, then the supplier of the water had to have been with them during the whole way. When he says the rock was Christ, he's not meaning that any more literally than I am the vine, I am the door, and expressions like that that you have in John's, in John's gospel. But with most of them, God was not pleased. Verses 1 to 4. Did Israel have great privileges? Absolutely. But privileges don't mean or don't guarantee success. And so uh, this is the example of Israel in the wilderness. Great blessings, but most of them were not approved by God. The application is in verses 6 to 13. Now these things happened as examples for us. They were examples for us. Do you know the word type and the types that are found in the Old Testament? 
This is the Greek word, type. These things were types for us. Here it's used in, uh, the, in the general meaning. These things were examples for us. He's going to say that same thing again in verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction. They were written for us. So what Paul is saying is that when you read the Old Testament, you should read it as a Christian and recognize this is our book. And what is found in the Old Testament is still written for our edification, for our, for our blessing. Uh, Paul says all scripture is inspired by God and profitable. So just because you say we are not under the law, as Paul has just said in, in chapter 9, that doesn't mean that we cannot learn from and that the, the things in the law are not for our, our benefit. So he says we need to learn the lessons. What were the reasons for Israel's failure? Just as he's given five blessings, uh, he is now going to give five reasons for Israel's failure. Uh, in verse uh, 6, verse six, um, do not, uh, these were examples for us that we should not crave easel, evil things as they also craved. Here, this is for lusting, craving things. Uh, this is referring to what you have in Numbers chapter 11 and verses 4 and 5. And uh, what you have in their discouragement and complaining is uh, wanting all of the things that they had in Egypt. The Israelites in the wilderness began to think with a very selective memory of just how good things were for them in Egypt. Christians often have selective memories or evaluations. We look at the world and sometimes it seems so attractive and we do not, we do not recognize, we shut out from our thinking all of the, all of the the tragic and evil and uh, destructive things of, of the world. So in Numbers chapter 11, uh, they, they lusted for the things of Egypt and a result at the end of the chapter was a great plague upon them. The second thing that he mentions is idolatry. Verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Do you remember in the wilderness where the first example of idolatry was of the Israelites? The golden calf. That's correct. Right after the giving of the law, uh, Aaron made a golden calf for them. What is idolatry? What is idolatry? You can make an idol out of anything. Anything that, you, that, that takes the place of God in your life is an idol. Here, there was a golden calf that Aaron made for the people. Now, when you look at the Israelites, they probably did not look at that golden calf and think of, of idolatry like the pagans who were worshiping a different god. That calf was meant to be a representation of Yahweh. They were not worshiping a, a different god. They were just making a, a, a representation of the true god. And yet, on that day, uh, there were 
3,000 that fell. Yes, Exodus 32. Yes, Exodus 32. That was your question. Okay. Uh, the third thing is verse 8. Nor let us act immorally uh, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. This is Numbers 25. And it was when the Moabites invited the Hebrew young men to, to one of their feasts. Do you remember that uh, Balak, king of Moab, had tried to get Balaam to curse the Israelites? He, God would not let those words of cursing come out of his mouth. And that's why you have the the three speeches of, of Balaam that, in which he blessed Israel three times. So he was not able to curse them. But you know what he did? He gave Balak counsel, advice, as to how he could get the Israelites to, uh, to stumble and fall in a different way. And that was by having the... Uh, the the, the young women seduce all of the Israelite men and invite them to the, to the feast. So what you see here is the immorality, the fornication. And uh, this subject of immorality, it was a great, remember, it was a great problem at Corinth. And it's a great problem today in our society. And it's a great problem for Christians. So that's the third, the third reason for failure. The fourth is in verse 9. Nor let us try the Lord. Tempt the Lord, try the Lord. It actually means to put the Lord to the test, as some of them did, and were destroy, destroyed by the serpents. This is Numbers chapter 21. And tempting the Lord or testing the Lord, uh, putting him to the test, is daring God to live up to his word. God, you, you, you said you would do this. Now, prove yourself. Um, that can be done in a spirit of challenging God, in a complaining kind of spirit. And uh, the result was the, uh, the fiery serpents in the wilderness. This is one, the passage that Jesus referred to as Moses lifted up the serpent in the, in the wilderness. They were poisonous serpents that bit the people. And then finally, uh, verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. You know what the problem is to follow, finding what he is referring to in the Old Testament? This happens so many times that it's hard to be specific. There are at least six chapters that uh, refer to the Israelites complaining, murmuring, grumbling in the wilderness. Exodus 15, 16, 17, right after they came out of Egypt right after the Passover, right after, uh, after they came out of Egypt. Numbers 14, 16, and 17. God, God considers complaining serious because ultimately we're finding fault with him. So these are specific examples from the Old Testament, warning, warning the Christians at Corinth not to sin. Now, verse 11, these things happen to them as an example. That is, they're an example for us. They're an example for us, uh, written for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages have come. So, Paul is saying here, 
that we, right now, we're the completion of all of the previous ages in God's program. And that we are to reap the benefit from all of these previous ages by learning the lessons of Scripture that we see relating to them.